hallmark stats, which I'll just walk you through. Uh, we recently hit this number, which we're very proud of, uh, where one million parents, educators, and kids trust us now. And we've also got um, a toy of the game, I mean, toy of the year award for, a uh, finalist award for um, our recent kit called Tacto Doctor. And some of our, uh, some of our, of the amount of games and the amount of production we have across these, uh, across these products is immense. And the kit we'll be talking about today is called Plugo. Plugo, as you see on screen, is um, we have a range of products in Plugo itself. Plugo is the name of the setup where you have the gamepad and the iPad in front of you. And these controllers are mapped to different subjects. So they're designed with different subjects in mind. So like you can see on screen, you have a music one, you have a letters one, we have a count one. And the today's talk will be about the coding kit. But before that, um, fidgetal is not a very common word, so you might not exactly know what fidgetal is. Uh, like I mentioned, this is our Plugo device where the iPad sits in front of you on the gamepad at the right uh, at a right angle, and the coding kit is how the kid inputs um, controls into the game. Basically, inputs are registered from the coding kit, and the iPad camera is capturing markers which are present at different uh, specific points at the kit itself. So that's how the that's how the digital works. That's the physical and the digital marrying together. And like I mentioned, this talk um, will walk you through the creation of our Plugo coding kit. And through the process of understanding this, hopefully you have some takeaways on how to design experiential learning for children. And so let's break it down. We have five main, sorry, five main chapters for this talk. Um, so understanding kids, ideating on the form, and all of these chapters basically tie into each other. So the first chapter will be understanding kids. So I've kept this, the meat of the conversation is always going to be about how we design the physical bit because understanding kids is something a lot of companies do and but it's a very important seed to the process. So here, what we try to do is, it's very important for us to interview age groups, I mean kids across age groups so that we can understand play behavior. So we're in, when we're interviewing, kids across age groups, some things we're keeping in mind is obviously developmental stages. So four to five years old is actually a huge jump. Five to six also is a huge jump. So we take care in terms of what exactly, like now with, since we're talking about coding in this talk, the amount of uh, cognitive load kids can take from four to five compared to five to six has to be kept in mind when you're going forward with the design of the kit itself. And in terms of designing games, we try to keep in mind the media and content kids are consuming these days because that becomes super important in deciding a theme, designing, uh, designing mechanics. So media and content is also, the internet is basically ubiquitous in trying to uh, connect kids from all over the world now. A kid in Hyderabad and a kid in New York, if they're playing Roblox together, actually have very similar interests and have things in common compared to maybe 10 years ago. So. We as play, uh, play Shifu, since we are designing for the world, it becomes easier to understand what these kids want when we are keeping up with the content they are consuming. So after the crucial step of understanding kids, um, what, we, what we do is we start ideating on the form itself. Um, the ideating of the form, I, when I mean ideating on the form, I mean the industrial design of the toy. So, but before we jump into maybe sketching out and uh, understanding what the subject is, I mean, understanding what the interactions will be about in the toy, we have to understand the coding uh, coding as a subject. So we break down the subject matter in terms of two ways, that is physical and the digital sense, because it's it's super important where some of the, some of the aspects of the subject are, can be addressed digitally, some of them can be addressed physically. And how we break it down is, I hope everyone's seen Karate Kid, where it's Mr. Miyagi comes and tells you to, um, you know, clean the clean the floors, wash the vessels, do a bunch of different stuff, which you get bored about. And then when you ask him, where's the real karate, he tries punching you. And then you automatically, muscle memory kicks in and you know, you know what you're doing. So the physical toy is trying to embody that kind of spirit where like coding is an extremely com complex subject. So once you go through the motions of the toy itself, you understand the subject through the toy. And hopefully it, can, it creates connections in the kid's mind once they're done playing with it. Um, so how that happens, we'll cover a little later. 
So that's what I meant by creating this metaphor of Mr. Miyagi. And one more thing we really take care in edtech games, a very common uh, problem is chocolate covered broccoli. What I mean by this is uh, broccoli is basically your learning, uh, learning content and the chocolate is a very thin layer of the game on top of the broccoli. Uh, so it's important to actually mesh these two together. When you're creating chocolate covered broccoli, you're actually spoiling the broccoli and you're spoiling chocolate also. It's a horrible thing. So we, this can be avoided only by truly empathizing with the children and actually breaking down the subject. So once we go through the process of breaking down the subject in terms of fundamental skills, uh, we basically identified for coding that these were the four skills we wanted to address in the coding kit itself. And after all these steps, once we've identified the core fundamental thinking processes of the children, we start the exciting stuff where uh, you start designing, start designing forms. So the main pillars for um, the main pillars for our design process was block-based programming. Block-based programming was something we uh, felt like would be the best way to communicate coding as a concept to children in our in this age group. And the Plugo tech stack is basically where there are some limitations regarding the physical side of things, where uh, the iPad camera can't really capture a certain, if the width of the kit goes beyond a certain measurement, the iPad camera can't capture the inputs. So this is just one of the umpteen number of details we need to keep in mind when industrially designing the kit. And of course, the critical bit is the cog cognitive ability of the target age group. So these are like the core, uh, the core overview pillows, uh, I mean pillars for deciding what type of kit do we want to have. And like you can see, block-based programming is already featuring in our, uh, in our form explorations. So once we have a very simple form, uh, what we try to do is have a toy-like mentality. We take a step back where uh, we find the open-ended toy in a subject. What do I mean by finding an open-ended toy in a subject? If you look at the bottom right GIF, uh, it's basically a number line. Uh, but this interaction has been turned into a toy where if you zoom in or zoom out, it shows you infinite numbers. It, if this is on a touch screen, I can imagine all of us just playing around with the number line and just trying to zoom into fractions, trying to look at decimals, trying to understand what the biggest number is. So if you give this to a kid, it's, it's giving a lot of steps and um, letting them understand magnitude, letting them understand fractions. And that is, uh, that is simply, I mean, achieved by thinking of it as a toy. So what we try to do here is, for example, for the for loop, we wanted to have an interaction where you can actually rotate a knob. Where, so if you're rotating a knob, uh, that kind of embodies the for loop. You don't have to exactly know what the for loop is doing, but through the physical action, you are trying to understand what the for loop is. So again, that Mr. Miyagi concept, you go through muscle memory. And for example, for an if, for an if condition, we wanted to include wires, but due to industrial uh, design constraints, we kind of went uh, away from that. And um, another critical point while designing the kit itself is we our interaction design canvas is the physical here. Usually if we are designing a purely digital game, the interaction design canvas is the mobile phone screen but ours are affordances which have to be kept in mind on the physical kit. So, of course, it has to be fun, it has to be fidgety, it has to be, if I place the Plugo coding kit maybe on a desk here, it should invite a player to come and just touch it, just, it should yearn for a player's attention. So, what we try to do in the industrial design is to include these emotional high elements where, for example, we could have kept a button for just entering the code, but we have decided to go with a lever mechanism because it's spring loaded and it feels nice. So, and it has that anticipation and um, the knob which you see on the left hand side has a clicker mechanism where it feels nice to just rotate the knob and it has that physical sense to it. Um, and one more thing why this is important is sometimes PlayShip products are played without the screen. You can role play here. You're, so, if you're physical design is that good and fun and inviting, you can actually just put a paper on the uh, floor and start role playing coding, coding games with just the kit itself. So keeping all these points in mind, this is what we came up with as the final, uh, intra, I mean not interaction, the uh, industrial design and the final form for what the kit was. Um, of course, we didn't land at it immediately after these uh, 
immediate steps, I'll explain why. Because there's a critical point which is missing, that is the digital bit. How do we design games for once the kit is realized? So, uh, here, basically now you have to decide which mechanics do you want to use. I'm not talking about an actual car mechanic, I'm talking about game mechanics. Uh, that joke clearly didn't land, but, <laughs> but I was trying. Uh, so, so you choose a game mechanic and after, and when you're choosing a game mechanic, you have to really keep in mind the foundational skills which we spoke about in the beginning. So, and this is something the whole conference knows because this is critical to designing any learning game. But before that, uh, each mechanic can be categorized into what I call playground, playground size. What is playground size? So now if you look at the multiple choice question at the left hand side, it is basically not providing the player with any more tools to understand uh, how to solve the problem. It's all prerequisite information which is required. And then if you know the answer, you know the answer. But if you look at Minecraft on the opposite end, where you decide your problem, we just give you a bunch of tools and then you figure out what you want to do in this world. So playground size basically uh, is the number of tools you're giving the player to figure out the problem you are, uh, you are presenting to them. So how you choose playground size is context dependent. It also depends on the project timeline. It depends on what kind of problem you're trying to address. Um, so how, how we usually did it and how we did it in this project in itself is first we looked at playground size and we tried to man, match it again to the foundational skills. So foundational skills is really at the core of this whole process. And what we ended up doing is since we have uh, a lot of my colleagues also are here, game designers. I myself am a game designer. Uh, so what we do is we break down foundational skills into these steps which we find in game genres. So for example, sandbox games, uh, if you just count decomposition as one, pattern recognition as two, abstraction as three, algorithm score. And you just start matching what genres match completely to the foundational skills you see. So you give it a score out of four, and then you decide whether you want to go with a genre which satisfies all four skills out of the box. Usually what pattern you'll find is that, um, the highlight's not appearing, uh, but usually what pattern you'll find is that here puzzle platformers have scored the highest, and that is the most common solution which you see in the market. So that might be the right solution because that's the playground size you're going for. Looking at your project timeline, looking at your uh, resources you're having, the puzzle platformers is a great solution. But if you want to go in a different direction, this tool at least gives you an understanding on, okay, uh, for example, in sandbox games, algorithms are not really addressed. How can I introduce, what are algorithms? Algorithms are basically just breaking down a problem and sequencing it into a flow. So if it's not there in sandbox games, how can I introduce that goal in a Minecraft type setting? So it gives you an opportunity to maybe create your own genre. Uh, another way is to look at something which is not from games at all, from maybe the physical sense. So something which we found very interesting while designing this kit is that a Rube Goldberg machine is actually coding. So when we go through it, you guys must have seen the Tom and Jerry episode when Tom's catching Jerry. And if you look at this machine closely, the scissors is a if condition. The, the wheelbarrow which you see at the end is a loop. So if you have this physical kind of uh, metaphor for what the game should be, it's also a very interesting way to come up with a new theme, a new mechanic. And of course, what we end up doing once we have our mechanics and once we have our, um, once we have decided which playground size we want to go for, is we quickly create, um, quickly create small screens on Figma or a prototype, whatever, whatever gets us to the idea the fastest. And we, have, we usually 3D print out um, the kit itself. So this is a 3D, uh, 3D printout of the kit and we're role playing in front of the game. This employees, we do it ourselves where we're like, okay, character moves from point A to point B, put this coding tile, put this number, uh, use the loop sliders, blah, blah, blah. And then once, if you're able to actually solve the level, the game design ends up informing the industrial design and then also vice versa. So role playing really kind of creates this handshake between uh, the industrial design and the digital sense. So you're able to understand, okay, um, have you missed out on maybe 
how the for loop is being represented. So if you actually uh, see, we've gone with not a knob which I mentioned in the beginning of the presentation because we ended up finding a lot of use cases where children would have to worry about how many times they have rotated. Now, are they going to rotate clockwise or anti-clockwise? Are we going to have a counter on the kit itself to count the number of rotations? All these things come out only when you role play with the game. So, and we're coming to the end almost because obviously this has been a long process and we don't want to get into too much of the details. Um, so, another very important thing in EdTech which um, me as a game designer and us as game designers really suffer with is designing themes which are appropriate to children because here um, in EdTech, we don't have clear standards like entertainment. Uh, we really, uh, we really look towards what the values of the company are and also try to understand what the parent's point of view is. Sometimes this causes a lot of subjectivity in the process. So for example, some person might not agree with pets as a concept, but some people might feel pets is a wholesome idea and let's make an educational game out of pets. So trying to inform that subjectivity is something we also struggle with, struggle with but what we do is we look inwards, we look towards the values of Play Shifu and look also towards who our target parents are. And this is an extremely important step because themes inform the mileage of your mechanic. So for example, if you jump in a space game and jump in a game on a farm are two very different things. So jump is common in that, but the theme is very different. And one more extremely critical step, saving uh, best for last, is play testing. And kids are cruel. They just tell you your game sucks, and it's it's hard, and then you have a long day. <laughs> uh, so what we what we do is um, we definitely observe more and talk less because we are designing learning experiences, and it's impossible for the child to kind of uh, understand and kind of synthesize what they have learned. So what we try to do is we look at what is the emotional graph. What do I mean by emotional graph? Uh, in the beginning, when we were designing the kit, when I walked you through the design of the kit, we were talking about uh, creating these fidgety uh, experiences, pushing the lever. Are they enjoying pushing the lever? Are they enjoying actually using the navigational knob? Are they having these emotional points also in game design? For example, now when you're designing a digital game on coding, um, you have these emotional high points when you are going through the process of coding. Just before you press, where before the compiler actually finishes its process, there's this sense of anticipation. And then when you see the red error, honestly, I still get scared when Unity throws me red errors in Office. I can't deal with that. So what is, are you capturing those emotions when a player is actually going through this? Um, another great example is when you went through a question paper when you were children in uh, school, when you found, this was maybe a personal observation from mine, when you saw a comprehension question, I was the happiest kid. But when you saw an actual question, uh, not, not that comprehension questions are not actual questions, but like when you have an essay question or something like that, it just, it brings up different emotions. So in a question paper, you have a roller coaster. So it's best you design experiences according to that emotion roller coaster and pay attention to whether those kids are actually following that roller coaster. If they're not, you need to revisit those steps. And like I mentioned, you have a learning experience. So Coding after play after they play test for maybe a 20 minute session or a 30 minute session, it's impossible for them to tell me, oh, I know what a for loop is. Um, so let's take a step back and maybe ask them prerequisite questions which they have in classrooms. Like an initial exercise which they have in classrooms is break down how you brush your teeth. Break down, uh, break down exactly what you do from getting up, uh, getting up in the morning and coming to school. Break it down into steps. And if there, if that process improves, I feel we have designed a successful coding kit. Um, yeah, and that's about it. And our coding kit recently released, and I would like to show you a trailer for that. One second, the sound is not coming up. Good. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Zig 
Zag Zoom. Oh, yes. Starstruck. Look at you, superb. Cancer constellation. The bomb bomb chase. Thank you, Madhav. Um, we're quickly going to run to questions because we don't have a lot of time. And I, this is my favorite part, but sadly, we always run out of time. Please keep your questions ready and you can just raise your hands and I'll give you the next mic. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very cool. Um, I want to know, uh, so clearly this has moving parts. Uh, one uh, is a question about the wear and tear and how long the toy actually lasts. And the second question is, how do you convey the instructions for play to the child? So, um, sorry, I thought the mic wasn't on. So, a great question. This is something we keep in mind during the industrial design process because we're designing for children. We take care of toxicity, hazards, wear and tear because they're kids. As soon as they see that bracket, that four slider delicate bracket, the first thing they're going to do is just go again and again. The lever is going to get, I don't know what they're going to do with it. So it's, we keep in mind for that, for the number of uses. The materials are also chosen carefully. Um, sorry, uh, the next part of the question? Uh, how do you convey these instructions to the child to play? So we have an onboarding process. As soon as you buy the kit and you place it on the Plugo gamepad, which I showed you, the blue one, um, we have an onboarding process which starts with the app, where the child is actually placing a few tiles on the toy and just trying to move maybe some preliminary, just very prototype character from point A to point B and just understanding how the kit works. And of course, each game which we have designed for in that experience also has a tutorial. Okay, awesome. Thank you. No Thank you for that question. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, for thinking like uh, to create a games in yeah. the car yeah. for the kids. Yeah. So that's what we are currently working on. Yeah. So on the design part. So what do you think about that, you know, uh, giving instead of phone in the car while you're traveling to the kid, giving the infotainment, like co-passenger infotainment system to the kid and he can do something on playing game, something. What is the idea? What is the thought about that? That's the first question. And the second is like, uh, uh, you know, do you have any experienced or maybe idea like, you know, designing the game inside the car? So what kind of genre or what kind of ideas, you know, we can you know brainstorm it to bring to the kids? So okay. I, yeah, just like, uh, you know, uh, curious what you are, you know. Okay. Uh, I would Madhav, say... Uh, sorry, one second. So we are running out of time. Uh, we'll try and make it quick, but I just want to let you know that Madhav is around. So if you do have more questions, please reach out to him and you all can have a conversation. So yeah, we can wrap, like you can answer this one and then we can wrap it up. Cool. So uh, I think the why behind why you want to keep a game inside the car is more important. Before you jump to a solution of, Okay, we want to have a car game. We want to have a, a deciding on what the experience is in the car. We have to just take a step back and understand what exactly the child is going through in the car. Why are we trying to solve a problem of what the child is doing in the car? Is the child getting bored? Maybe, maybe the child just wants juice. So maybe you want to design a bunch of snacks instead of, uh, instead of a game. So the asking the why behind the before you get to the problem, I think is more important than the solution in itself. So the understanding the kid's step, I feel that is super critical. We'll take one last question and we can yeah. make it quick. Uh, how, how to better plan the reward system uh, to make right. the kid uh, hooked to that game or like a, whatever right. way they are playing? So this is where chocolate covered broccoli comes in. So extrinsic rewards are s extremely great in bringing back children for a small amount of time. So for example, uh, when you went to school on your birthday, you get a sticker which you put in your almanac. That's an extrinsic reward. So uh, these things are really great in games to a certain extent at the meta level. But and in its own sense, we need to have a game where it meshes it meshes mechanics together. 
so uh, meshing mechanics is more important i feel than the uh, than the reward system because honestly uh, free to play games have got this they've done this so well that we can get inspired from so many uh, existing mechanisms of how they reward uh, reward you know, reward kids for attention blah 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 the umpteen number of talks we have at this conference for that so yeah that's what i feel